everyone, I'm uh, Emmanuel Degas, working for Trace TV. We are uh, French broadcasters, and uh, the goal of this presentation is to present uh, famous uh, open source projects and how we use it in a broadcast environment. So Trace is a, a bunch of different kind of channels. We have uh, four play TV, linear music channels, uh, sports entertainment channels. We have uh, one radio station FM, and just from from uh, since now we have one RNT radio station. So we deal with uh, 19 feeds, uh, all produced and broadcast from Paris, and uh, broadcasted in 160 countries over 38 satellites. So in my team, uh, there is two uh, Roman Lane, who is a technical broadcast manager, and Jeremy Dipe, who is here with us today, uh, who is a technical and development manager. There are four other people working with us. Uh, we have in our uh, computer room 70 servers to monitor and maintain, provided by 20 different constructors. Uh, we have uh, hundreds of clients over each time zone. So for us, uh, daytime doesn't really mean anything. It is daytime for one of our clients all the time. And uh, no one in the technical team is working on site uh, at night or during the weekends. Uh, so how to proceed? Some dramatic effects. I don't have the sound. Oh, sorry. Okay, I will, I will speak louder now. Okay. So first uh, implementation of an open source project is uh, Nagios. Uh, it is, uh, I, if I um, remember correctly, the very first project we implement. This is really the key uh, for us to sleep. So as you can see uh, on this uh, graphic here, uh, you have all the different servers and equipment we have, all the different uh, playout servers, the different automation servers, the different uh, graphic servers, the encoders, the maxing equipments. All of them are in the in the Nagios graphic uh, in this graphic interface here. Basically, when I first implemented the uh, version 3.3.1, uh, it was very uh, for this graphic view at first, uh, because if it was red, something went wrong and. Uh, any of our technicians could easily understand what the problem was. And uh, we had some uh, basic uh, send mail uh, 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 warnings which were configured. So basically, this is really important for us because any of our technicians, and we have even some people at Trace who are not even technicians but who are working on call, can understand what's wrong even if they're not technician. Because basically, you know exactly this has crashed, I need to reboot this server. And you may not even understand what are the interaction between the different servers. And you may be oper uh, in an in operational context, uh, context, it may work. Uh, all the scripts uh, I first uh, wrote were Perl. And it is, I think, really simple to implement, as I'm not a, a really good coder. <laughs> um, this uh, scripts were mainly designed to um, to um, sorry to read some log files and uh, recognize some some patterns, warning errors, and then do some uh, some conditional uh, logics to know if it is important or not to return to the operator who is on call. Uh, but then the project uh, has evolved. Now uh, Jeremy is in charge of. Uh, of uh, evolving it. Uh, so now we, we stopped the email warnings and we're working di directly with uh, SNMP traps, directly from the different broadcast equipments. So it is much more uh, precise and convenient and we go further in the diagnosti diagnosis, diagnostics. Sorry. So basically now we receive on our phone, uh, often in the middle of the night, I don't know why, or during our bus days, or all these weird days where everything crashes. And uh, we receive precise uh, m message, uh, which says directly which equipment crashes, what kind of problem, is it a hardware problem related to, uh, like let's say, uh, you see uh, a consumption is to 100%, uh, or the system is off, but it can s we can monitor to um, uh, some application, or is they crashed. And, uh, what we are working on uh, right now on uh, this environment is uh, to send to uh, via SNMP uh, orders or to what we do right now is uh, we have a changeover equipment, SDI changeovers, uh, which are manufactured by Nevion, which is a Swedish company. And uh, we can, uh, so the princip principle of this changeover is to switch to some uh, loop in case of we have a problem on our main signal. And now we can directly send uh, an SNMP trap to switch uh, directly in act 
in, when we acknowledge the, the issue, it will directly switch to the, to the main feed when the problem is solved, which saves a lot of time, especially when you're doing everything remotely on a VPN in, your, in, the, in the middle of the night. You just acknowledge the problem and you switch the, 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 the signal from backup to main, main the main signal or the opposite. And uh, this, uh, this is, uh, has been more developed too, the, the tactical view. Uh, which is much more just a, a bunch of uh, a list of alerts or, or warning, but it is m uh, much more easy to deal with. As uh, as you can see, our view this was the view probably last year, and we had more and more and more equipment, so it started to become a little bit busy over there. And this is much more clear to be redirect redirected to any of the different equipment. So another project uh, we work uh, with is a Google API. Um, this was uh, 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 for the co uh, marketing department, it was a requirement for the marketing department because as we have all these clients uh, and always in the middle of the night, like let's say we have a call, uh, I will make it, it short for you, but like I will have like calling from Indonesia, I have black signal, dot, and uh, of course I don't know by heart all my uh, hundreds of clients. So it is a really easy way to just zoom in, or if you're not too bad in uh, geography, you zoom into the country and you may find your two or three uh, clients in there. Then we have like some color code to make it, uh, make it more, uh, which clients are more important. I won't say the names. Uh, and uh, we, when we click here, we have like the smart card information, client information, phone numbers, uh, the codec uh, used on the satellite they are receiving. You have two of all the different uh, uplink station and you can create two uh, like uh, group emails, uh, group contacts, and send an automatically generated email to all of them. Like let's say we know that there's an issue at the, this uplink station because of, of the uh, of um, child parent uh, logic, it will send directly to the concerned person the same email saying like we have now an issue on here. Uh, we work too uh, with uh, another project named Redmine uh, what helped us uh, a lot too, uh, for much more for the on-call management uh, for its calendar. But as you can see here, we, we are doing our project management uh, in the Ghent interface there. I think I, I love this, uh, this, uh, this project and uh, it makes it much more easier. Uh, what we do too is uh, we are working this year on uh, establishing our first uh, QoS uh, report which basically are just some uh, SQL requests directly uh, sent to the MySQL core of Redmine. Because as we will report there all the different incidents we have uh, on air uh, during the year, we just then uh, do some SQL requests on, so on some keywords and we can have like, how many incidents we have uh, related to transmission, related to, to, to crash of some servers, etc., and produce pretty easy uh, some QoS uh, reports. Uh, Trace Central, this is a much more uh, 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 dedicated to, uh, to the end user uh, because uh, when I arrived at Trace uh, four years ago or even three years ago, um, all the person there uh, was still working with a lot of paper, like just for the workflow, internal workflow process to know like verification process, uh, like when we receive media from other uh, pr uh, content providers uh, and it was really complicated for them to check the quality of what we receive, of what we send. So basically it's just a really simple uh, form. But uh, the Bootstrap uh, project uh, makes, uh, I think, uh, uh, um, it is very easy to have this kind of interface uh, all around because, uh, because uh, of its variety and how it, it is resized uh, automatically on the different platforms. Uh, iPads, uh, iPhone, etc. Um, then uh, well I it is based on a MongoDB uh, database. Uh, I like the idea of just pushing my JSON in this database and get it back. I, I like. I think it is it is very simple to to use. Uh, okay. Uh, then uh, we created too this uh, this uh, inter web interface for a file converter. It's kind of the same. Many of our people are converting files without even really understanding what SD or HD is. So we just buy needed like an interface. You throw a, you throw a file in there, and it will say correct, not correct, without even for someone who doesn't even know what is a video format. 
and uh, we'll say some it's really to have something really user friendly and it helps a lot our team and then it the, the conversion work is done by FFmpeg scripts um, we use FFmpeg2 for uh, some uh, RTMP transmission toward Dailymotion. You can stream our, our live uh, channels uh, directly on Dailymotion. And, uh, and so basically what we do is like we take directly our UDP multicast uh, IP streams from our encoders. We send it to FFmpeg. We created different bit rates depending what the Dailymotion or, or YouTube wants. We are working with YouTube now too. And uh, we just push to their RTMP server. Uh, and then like all the different stuff uh, which are implemented in the Debian uh, uh, operating system are really helpful, the dot desktop scripts. I work too with a program named, uh, a very sh small program named Supervise, which just detect when the application crash and re auto restart the application. And then you can add some lines in the script. So like first it just sent a mail to say like the Dailymotion server just crashed or I know we are working for, for this year to replace this by SNMP traps to be integrated in Nagios as well. I remember I forgot something uh, too, is uh, that a big project uh, that we're working on is uh, merging the Redmine and Nagios environment because what we would like is, like I said earlier, when in Nagios we are an alleged problem, we would like it to create automatically the incident in the Redmine. Okay, sorry. So, um, so that's uh, the ongoing project. So we are uh, friendly users of uh, open end uh, solutions uh, 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 based on uh, on uh, Christoph's product so it helps on many different tasks uh, the first uh, the first one is uh, i think we implemented is uh, the the recording and sample extraction for uh, OTT VOD extra uh, so our feeds are recorded 24 hours uh, a day on a server uh, through the open end uh, interface and the open in interface provides to a very simple way to extract, to scroll the, the, live, the, the stream which has been broadcasted and extract what we want, which is exactly what, what, uh, what uh, the, the VOD team wants. Or uh, it can help too for uh, legal compliance in France with the CSA when they say like we want to have an extract of that video clip from yesterday at 6. It is very easy to do. We just uh, implemented, so this is a project uh, uh, on uh, which uh, Romain is working, uh, implemented uh, an IP changeover system, uh, still another uh, open end solution. What is uh, very uh, uh, convenient is uh, that, so okay, so we switch from the main feed IP stream, we can switch to a local file, uh, which, is, uh, which is played locally on the server. Uh, the switch is very smooth and we are really happy with it to then contribute to our different uh, uh, dat mm, data centers. Uh, what is convenient too is uh, that the local um, file uh, which can be directly extracted from the previous application. Uh, so because back in the time it was we had always to ask the production team to record what happened a couple days ago and then convert it and insert it in the system. There we just move a file, extract it from open end, and then it always looks quite recent when we switch uh, toward it. Uh, then uh, we are w right now implementing uh, open end products too for, uh, for our internal IPTV network. So you just have a, a server, the uh, open end key, and you basically have some, uh, some cards uh, to, have the, to receive TNT, mixing everything with with uh, your own uh, your own uh, UDP multicast streams. Um, okay, and there is a, a little sum up of the different projects I just mentioned. Um, I think we can go for the questions. Eventually not, but I can say a lot. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so the question is: uh, is uh, if we have evaluated how much money we saved uh, with uh, using open source, and I answer a lot because, uh, just for example, I remember one of the very first um, 
Mm, at first, it didn't really save money. It saved uh, our life quality as a technician <laughs> because uh, the first Nagios implementation just helped us to sleep what was really not possible the first two years when I launched the first channels. So yes, this has no value, sleep. And then, uh, yes, uh, I remember that we needed to record the streams uh, for the CSA, co CSA compliance and uh, just a recorder uh, provided by any uh, commercial services like for between five or ten grays for one feed so uh, yes now with like dif different open source servers it's mu it's much more convenient designed for broadcasters <laughs> and yes cheap and uh, ki what I like to in all these different servers we have now is like we are buying a bunch of servers and if they crashes we can just replace it as it is compared to the commercial world when you have any problem with any commercial server uh, you just have to wait that they send another one and it can just be replaced as easily as just buying a Dell or HP server yes Uh, s 260, uh, so the question is, uh, are, is uh, are we encoding real time uh, in X265? We haven't tried yet. I just have I just tried the X265 uh, decoder. I'm mainly interested in the X265 projects uh, to save the to save uh, space uh, because of the the bandwidth reduction. Uh, this is my main focus for the moment. But uh, but uh, archive is. Uh, uh, is uh, central in our projects much more for the June to December 2015 uh, uh, roadmap. Right now we are working on uh, on finalizing this uh, integration with more uh, between Aegis, Redmine. We are finalizing this at the beginning of this year and then we will we'll have to save space with our recorded files. So yes, I, def I will definitely consider the X265 project. So, so the question is uh, regarding the different uh, codec we are using. Um, uh, we are using mainly UDP multicast. Uh, we are using some RTMP for the daily motion uh, platform, and um, for adaptive streaming, uh, it's an external uh, it's an external company wi who does it from for us from the UDP streams. I haven't really looked closely this question for the moment. Can you elaborate a bit? On scale, um, you say 70 servers, that doesn't sound too much. Uh, yes. Do you have like 200 users or 2 million? Users? You, you mean... Uh, End devices. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Because uh, when I mean 70 servers, is like our control room is made of 70 servers, different uh, graphic servers, playout servers for our 90 feeds. That's and our goal is clearly to uh, decrease this number working on uh, on the virtualization now we are we i consider buying some uh, some blades and uh, and try this a different uh, i haven't made my choice yet between the different virtualizations uh, solution but yes it will really help us to decrease uh, the the number of servers because we don't have that much space in our offices so for us it's already too much 70 server Do you see, have you, have you investigated uh, if they are free open source tools? Yes. Service, and where do you see the, where open source is valuable and where maybe less uh, at the moment? Uh, For the moment, uh, I've, uh, I remember, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm uh, because I'm not sure I remember exactly the names. There is one named uh, Cinderella. Cinderella, I remember that one. And I remember another one, um, but I'm really sorry, I won't find the name again. Uh, I really see uh, the force uh, regarding the production team for the transcoding options for the moment, because this is what we are doing. Like especially when we have to transcode always the same file in the same format, we always implement some FFmpeg uh, st uh, scripts here and there. Uh, regarding editing, it seems really complicated to me. I mean, even for our um, editor team, even to for switching from two commercial products from a Final Cut to toward Avid, it seems already extremely complicated 
Uh, yeah, it will, any case, whatever you choose, it will cost a lot of money in training for all the teams. Or uh, they may just refuse. Uh, and uh, we don't really have, uh, we, have we are kind of entitled uh, <laughs> on that aspect. Uh, for the moment, we are only working on a final cut, but we have issues with uh, MXF on the last version uh, Final Cut Pro 10. So yes, we are reconsidering the different uh, options, but I haven't made my, my choice yet. And, uh, and what about the handling of the production formats? Because yeah, they have different, uh, sometimes complicated formats. That yes, but basically we simplified everything as in just you know, working with uh, our uh, ready-to-broadcast files from A to Z. We are working on MXF XDCAM uh, 50 megabits from A to Z. They edit directly fr on the on the ready to broadcast files and it's just a different folder and a copy but we, we decided to do this so everything we receive basically go in a in a watch folder and is being transcoded to mxf xdcam to be then reused by the editors or whatever ott application welcome yes Uh, <coughs> see if I understand correctly, the question is: uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, are there experimental FFmpeg servers? Yeah. Yes and no, but I think like when the the owner of my uh, of my group uh, see how cost effective it is to use FFmpeg, uh, the experimental world just disappear and they consider it uh, in production mode. So yes, it's been used since three years now, and I don't reconsider. Yeah. Debian, sorry? Yeah, Debian, are we a poor operating system of the Oh, our servers are under Debian with it. All of them. Okay, but the EWPO environment, for example, yeah? Yes, yes. And we use this little jQuery interface for, for our use end users to access the servers because we don't really want them to be involved in the server. Mm -hmm. Yes? <coughs> how the clients are transferring the files to you, and how how you contain that uh, like certain files might uh, contain viruses and then also contaminate others. So it is a. Uh, <coughs> Uh, so the question is, uh, how do we protect ourselves from external content from vi virus? And, yes, uh, and uh, also how, how you receive because uh, it is a large amount of data. It is really, really complicated today. Uh, Trace main customers and main producers, because we have many offices in different countries, are from South Africa, from Malaysia, and from South America. And uh, for example, in the case of South Africa and Johannesburg, it is extremely expensive to write just a uh, symmetrical guaranteed one megabytes connection internet it is a uh, several grand a month so it's extremely expensive so in this case we are still are working with our drives they send our drives we send back our drives we try signals we tried ftps there are many many timeouts all the time on the, on the ftp station as soon as we l basically leave europe or the us so yes, for the moment, the, ex the quickest way is still hard drive. And uh, I've heard of uh, an open source project named Catapult, which I would like to try, made by, uh, in Latin America, but I don't have more information yet. And uh, to protect from virus, I think the, uh, the Apple and uh, Linux environment we have, because we don't really have PCs in our, in our, our facilities, really helps to to stop, to prevent from a uh, virus uh, uh, expansion. I'm sorry, I hope you answer your question. <laughs> ah, I was wondering. Yes, okay. Question also about the licensing. Have you considered this problem of, yeah, you use these encoders and normally they are licensed. How do you, how do you deal with this? What, what do you mean? Um, the, the MPEG license. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm really, I'm, I'm not aware. <laughs> Yes. Um, uh, you just mentioned you are saving a lot of uh, money and uh, operational time. Yes. Uh, does your group allow you to actually do uh, uh, distribution and to give back to the, uh, to the community? For the moment, they. I think for the moment they just see that there is a value in the op in the open source projects. It took five years to just reach that goal. 
because when I arrived, they just didn't want to hear about it or I use it in secret. And it's after two years of FFmpeg working that they oh, but oh, yes, uh, indeed, it's interesting. Like first, they didn't even want f uh, to pay for my train ticket to come here because I come here every year uh, because they really didn't consider the open source. They were ashamed of it. And I remember the three, four, f the three first years, uh, I was not really allowed to do this kind of presentation. Maybe we have to stop here. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, this is it. I ask the question after. So, thank you very much, Emmanuel. Okay. And, and the next door.